Hey, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Ex- or, sorry, yes, Exodus, Exodus chapter 12 today, Exodus chapter 12. Um, as Elias said in the video, we are in this series called God Is, and we're spending a little bit of time working through the, the, character, uh, the characteristics and the, uh, the, the traits of God. Who is this God that, that we serve? And we're studying him through his interaction with his people in uh, in Egypt, when the Israelites were living as slaves, and we see God interact with, uh, with his nation, and it reveals a whole lot about him. So we've been on this journey for, uh, for quite some time, and today we're going to look at the characteristic of, of justice. We're going to see how God is just. Now, don't tune that out. All right, for a second. I know we would much rather come to church on a Sunday uh, where we talk about how God is love, right? That, that kind of makes us feel a whole lot better. When we talk about the justice of God, we tend to kind of push back a little bit and say, uh-oh, um, get, you know, he's going to step on my toes today. What's he going to say? This, this could get bad. Just hang with me just for a second. I believe this is a very important characteristic of God. That is his justice. In fact, I'll go ahead and say this. I don't think anyone can understand the love of God unless we first understand the justice of God. So God is just. This is a very important quality and nature of who God is. Now, I want to also define the term just. When I say that God is just, what what do I mean? Uh, Well, just is not equal to the word fair. A lot of times we, we kind of use these words synonymous, justice, and, and fairness, and, and there is a lot of overlap. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's some overlap. All right, you with me? There is some overlap between justice and, and fairness, but listen, they are not the same. I would argue that a person can be just and not fair, and also a person can be fair and not just. So when we use the word just today, here's what we're meaning. We're meaning right in judgment, all right? To be right in your judgment. When we use the word fair, it means uh, that you are equal in treatment, all right? So if you're taking notes, just means right in judgment. Fair means you're equal in treatment. Let me, let me just kind of give you an, uh, an illustration just so we're all on the same page. I have three daughters, um, Aaron and I have, have three beautiful girls. And here lately, I've just been watching them grow up. Um, one of them had a birthday in June, and they're, they're like fixing their hair. And, and this weekend, we were, we were at this wedding, and they're getting all dolled up. And I'm looking at my girls, and I'm like, wow, they are so beautiful. They are, they are growing up so fast. Any, any parents just kind of um, agree? It's like, I cannot believe we are at this stage in, in parenthood. Now, if I were to tell, if I were to line up all three daughters, we just got, away, uh, just, you know, got out of the wedding this weekend. In fact, our middle daughter came home. like, Daddy, I caught the bouquet. Um, it's like... <laughs> Throw it back, okay? <laughs> like, that, that's not, you know, throw it back. Um, but she, she, was all, uh, she was all excited. Now, if I were to tell all three of them, listen, you cannot date until you're 40, right? If you can't date until you're 40, listen, that would be fair, wouldn't it? If I looked at the 12-year-old and the 8-year-old and the 6-year-old and I told all of them equally, I treated them all the same you can't date until you're 40, that would be fair. Now, is that just? Is that the right call as a dad? Now, I would say yes. <laughs> they would probably say no. Daddy, that is not, ju- that is not the right judgment. Now, uh, so you can see, I can be fair, I could treat them equally, but not be just. Now, parents, we can also be just and not be fair. Uh, let me use cookies uh, for an example because I like to talk about cookies, right? Um, if I had all three girls and I lined them up and I said, you get four cookies, you get two cookies, and you get no cookies, guess what? The person that gets no cookies is screaming, that's not fair. Dad, that, that's not fair. Why does she get four cookies? Why does she get two cookies? And why do I get zero cookies? Dad, that's not fair fair. But it's not fair, is it, buddy? But is it just? Well, it might be. If 
one daughter earned, you know, did something that day and she, she earned uh, the reward of, of getting four cookies and, and another daughter did something to earn two cookies and, and another child might have been bad. They, they might have done something that, that disappointed mom and dad. And so as their punishment, they got no cookies on that day. And that could be the right judgment. That could be just, but it wouldn't be fair. If you're with me, Sam, I'm with you. So when we say that God is just, what we mean is that he is right in judgment, right? God is perfect when it comes to the judgment calls that he makes. If God were an umpire, right, perfect judgment call every single time. God is right in all of his judgments, and we've got to understand this, because how many of us, we, we want to look around in the world, and we, and we want to scream, hey, God, there's, there's injustice. Hey, God, there's things that are going on that, that don't seem right. God, I see evil happening in the world, and I see evil flourishing in the world. God, when are you going to, to, to make it right? God, when are you going to bring these people to, to accountability? God, when are you going to do something about all the evil and all the sin and all the bad in the world? And so there's a part of us that we actually long for, and we cry out for the justice of God, unless it has to do with us, right? Then it's like, God, I don't, don't, don't give me justice. Don't give me what I deserve. Give me grace. Give me mercy. Be slow with me. Be patient with me. And we, we kind of tune into that sort of attribute of, of God. But what we've got to see today is that the justice of God and the love of God have to both apply, and when you take the justice of God and the love of God and those two things collide, guess what you have? You have the gospel message. That is so core to the gospel. Today in um, Exodus chapter 12, we're going to uh, just read a story and we're going to see God's justice kind of uh, play out. And we see it kind of come full circle as he's dealing with uh, the Egyptians and he's also dealing with his people um, of Israel. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of your year. Now, I love what God does here right off the bat. He, he basically restarts the calendar for Israel. Why would he do that? He's basically saying, that, hey, what is about to happen, remember, they've been living as slaves for 400 years. And God, is, God has been preparing them. In fact, the, the 10 plagues that, that Stephen covered last week, it wasn't like 10 days, okay? It wasn't like day one, this plague, day two, this plague. This happens over an extended period of time, probably less than a year, but probably more than a few months. And so they are watching God distinct himself, separate himself from the gods of Egypt, and they're ready, and they're waiting. They've been crying out to God for deliverance, and they're right at the door to break out of slavery. They're right there. And what does God say? You restart the clock. Restart your calendar. This, is the, this month is to be the beginning of months for you. It's like God is saying, listen, what I'm about to do, I'm about to give you a fresh start. I'm about to give you a new beginning. So much that for the, that the rest of your nation, you will refigure uh, the way you calendar the days. Verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, this is the first month, all right, day 10, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their fathers, families, one animal per family. Verse 4, if the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each will eat. Verse 5, you must have an unblemished animal a year old, you may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Let's stop right there. Does this not seem a little bit random to anybody? Think about it, all right? You're, you're Israel. You're crying out to God for slavery. You're, you're watching God, you know, do the frogs and, and, and do the hell and, and do the flies and the gnats and, and all those things. And now God tells you, all right, hey, why don't you take your family and everybody, on the 10th day, on the same day, we're going to have Lamb Adoption Day. You're going to go out into the fields, and your family, your household, is going to select a lamb or a goat. And it's got to be perfect. It's got to be a year old. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring it home and bring it into your 
house for four days. Does that seem a little bit random? Do what? It's like a, just think about pet adoption day, okay, at the pet store. You know, people show up and there's like seven animals and, you know, they, they get them adopted. There's, there's, there's 500,000 households in the nation of Israel. This was a big ordeal. Everybody on the 10th day of this new year is going out selecting a lamb because God said it, we need to have a pet in our house. He's going to live with us. He's going to sleep with us. We're going to feed him. He's going he's to drink with us. He's going to be in our household for four days. It seems a little bit random. What in the world is God doing? Now, look at verse 6. We'll continue reading. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. Say what? Wait, that, that just seems kind of mean, doesn't it? That seems kind of cruel. This would not fly today. <laughs> Go out, bring an animal, bring it home, take care of it. Four days later, I want you to slaughter. Not just by yourself, but everybody. All these households. Just imagine the blood in Egypt at this particular time. God goes on and gives more instructions. They must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. They're to eat the meat that night and they, sh- they should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in boiling water, but only roast it over fire, its head as well as its legs and inner organs. You must not leave any of it until morning. Any part of it left until morning you must burn. Here is how you must eat it. You must be dressed, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You're to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. Again, Doesn't this seem a little bit random? God, what are you doing? You want us to go and select an innocent lamb that hasn't done anything wrong. And you want us to bring it into our house. And then you want us to slaughter it. But that's not the end, right? You want us to take the blood and paint it over the doorpost of the house. And then you want us to eat it. And not just like the good parts, like lamb chops. You want us to eat all of it. And if we don't eat all of it, you want us to burn the rest of it. And you even told us how to eat it. We don't just eat this casually, at a, like at a wedding feast. It's, it's kind of a casual environment. You want us to eat it in a hurry with our sandals on and our cloak on and our staff in our hand. Hey, God, that's not the way we eat around here. We like to enjoy our food, right? We like to take our sandals off. We like to put the staff in the umbrella closet, right? You're asking us to do something that seems a little bit random, but what what do we know that God's doing? He's preparing them for the exodus. The reason he's saying, look, you got to eat this in a hurry because he's saying, look, I'm coming. And when I come, I'm going to deliver you. And that's the moment. That's the marker that you're out of here and you're no longer living as a slave, but you're living in total, complete freedom. Now, this is a picture here of what, what we know of, of ultimately the, the sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ and our spiritual freedom. But we've got to understand that there is a justice of God here. There is a judgment of God, a right judgment of God. And, and look at verse 12. Here's, here's what the Lord says. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals, I am the Lord. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. This is the justice of God right here. I will execute judgments. How can a loving God do that? Because this loving God that we serve, he is also a just God. And listen, in order to be just, if you're, if you're a judge and you're going to be just, in order to be judge, uh, in order to be just, you must punish evil. And so when we say that God is just, what, what we're saying is that God must punish sin. He cannot allow sin to go unpunished. He, he cannot allow sin to go unreckoned with. He will deal with it. In fact, in the the New Testament, it says this, that God will not be mocked. You can't mock God. Look, and I I, I look around, and I see a lot of people that 
they just commit evil, and, and, and today we even invent ways of doing evil. <laughs> and there, there are things that, that, that I see that our kids are, are dealing with and our kids are facing. I'm like, I have no idea. I had someone ask me, they said, Andy, when you were a student pastor 10 years ago, how did you handle this? I said, we didn't handle that. That, that wasn't even around uh, 10 years ago. Listen, God will not be mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. And so we know that God is a God of justice, and his justice requires him to punish sin. And so that's what he does. He executes judgment. But notice who he executes it against, against all the gods of Egypt. Here's what he's saying. He's like, look, I, I've got to bring my judgment against these false idols. I've, I've got to bring my, my judgment against, uh, uh, against these people that are, uh, that are seeking after other things that aren't, that aren't the one true God. I, I can't stand for this. I can't allow this to go on. I can't allow this to, to continue. And this whole time period of God going through these uh, 10 plagues, it's him distinguishing himself from all the other false gods and idols. He's saying, look, I'm the one true God. No one compares to me. I am worthy of your attention. I am worthy of your worship. Nothing else. Everything else is a dead end road. I'm the one who brings life. And so he deals with it. He executes judgment. Now, you might be thinking, again, we kind of mentioned this earlier, where's the love of God? Like if God is, if God is bringing this judgment, like, like where is his love? We see it in the, in the very next verse, verse 13. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. Here it is. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. So now all of a sudden, all these things that God was saying a few moments ago that seemed completely random, now all of a sudden it makes sense. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He doesn't say when, when you get your act together, when you get your life right, then I'll pass over you and I won't bring about my judgment. God doesn't say, if you have perfect attendance at church, I'll pass over you. God doesn't say, if you give financially and support the ministry, I'll pass over you. He doesn't say those things. God doesn't say, as long as your good outweighs your bad, I'll pass over you. He doesn't say that because he's just. He has to do something with sin. Believe it or not, he can't just let it go. He can't. He's got to do something with it. So what does he do? He provides a way for the Passover. You bring in the lamb on day 10, Day 14, you slaughter it. You apply the blood to the doorposts, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over. This is a picture of the gospel. The innocence of this lamb taking on the sacrifice that this family would deserve to pay. This is God's justice colliding with his grace. This is God's justice colliding with his love, and this is the gospel message. Listen, maybe you're wondering, Andy, I've heard preachers say all the time that I need to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but I really don't know if I should. What's the big deal about this guy that lived 2,000 years ago who died on a cross? Let me tell you what the big deal is. Did you know that it was Passover week that he came into Jerusalem? In fact, it was day 10. Turn to your neighbor and say, whoa. I think that's whoa. Did you know that he was crucified on day 14? Four days later? It's not random. It's not accident. That's by God's design. Did you know that followers have called, called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Do you know his blood was not shed on an execution table? His blood was shed on a cross member that goes up this way and a cross member that goes this way. The cross is our doorpost. And I, wanna, I want you to notice that it wasn't about the nation of Israel just knowing what the blood can do, right? It wasn't the knowledge that saved them. And it wasn't taking the blood of the sacrifice and applying it to some secret area of their house. 
This was actually having to be obedient to God, living by faith. Like, can you imagine the faith of that night? Like sitting there painting that blood on the doorpost, trusting that God is going to be faithful to keep his word. Because if he doesn't, the oldest child, the oldest male child in that house is dying that night. And so it's not applied in some secret room. What is it? It's applied on the doorpost for all to see. This was a public declaration saying we are accepting the sacrifice on our behalf. And this was God saying, I'm accepting the sacrifice on your behalf. Can I tell you something about Jesus? Listen, placing your faith and trust in him is not just some private thing we do in certain areas of our life. It's a public declaration. It's saying, I choose to take the blood of Jesus Christ as my sacrifice. God is just But here's the thing. He's also the justifier. Don't you know that that we love to justify ourselves all the time? Anytime someone asks us a challenging question, hey, why why are we late for work? Well, it was the school bus. Hey, why why, why didn't you do this? Well, uh, you know, I had this, you know, thing. Like, we're we're quick. If you don't believe me, just ask your kids, you know, the next time they're in trouble. You know, hey, did you do, uh, when I ask my girls, did you do this? They don't say yes or no, (laughs) do they? They say, but she said, like, they go into the immediate justification of why that thing occurred. We do the same thing. But God, I, I grew up with this circumstance. But God, I, I, had, I had this challenge. But, but God, we, we, we try to justify ourselves, and, and we can't. And God knows this. And so in his love and in his grace and his mercy, he says, look, I, I, because I'm just and I must punish sin, and because you're on that side, there's no way for you to get to me, here's what I'll do. I will justify you on your behalf. So that's what God did. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, church, this is good news today. This is good news today. Now, for some of you, this may be the very first time you've ever heard this. And if it's the very first time you've ever heard this, listen, you're not here by accident. God has you here on purpose to hear this message and you have the opportunity now to respond to the justice of God and the love of God in your life. And I can't do that for you, and your neighbor can't do that for you. That is a decision that you have to make. And for probably many of you here today, this is something that you're familiar with. But listen, I don't want it to be too familiar. You get get what I'm saying? Sometimes when something becomes familiar, we begin to take it for granted, and it becomes too familiar. Listen, the gospel should never become too familiar. When we hear the gospel message of what God did for us by sending his own son to die in our place, that should never make us think, oh, I've heard that before. No, what should that do? That should move us to respond. That should move us to continue to live for him. Now, here's the other little piece of this whole Passover. And God told them after this, they would remember this uh, for year after year after year. There was unleavened bread that they were to eat with this meal. And we know in the Bible that, that leaven is often a, a symbol of sin. Unleavened simply means without sin. So they were to eat bread without leaven, right? They were to eat bread symbolizing without sin. And this is why this is so important. It was a sacrifice and then the unleavened bread. It was the sacrifice. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. And then people could pursue a life without sin. But what do we try to do? We try to get our life cleaned up. We try to get rid of the sin and then come to God. And God says, no, 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 you get it backwards. You come to me just as you are. I save you. I forgive you. I cleanse you. And then you can begin this, not a two-day journey, okay, not a one-year journey, but a lifelong journey of dying to self and taking on the identity of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about this gospel message, it may sound simple, right? It may sound like something we've ever heard before, but my prayer for you and my prayer for me is that it would deepen our love for him, it would expand our commitment to him, and we would continue to greater live for him and serve for him each and every day of the week. So you have a response. I have a response to the gospel message. So the question is, What's your response? Listen, we're going to have a time in just a second to observe communion together. And normally we do this kind of towards the beginning of the service, but today as we talked about the the Passover, uh, we wanted to save this for for the end. And as I just mentioned, when, when God 
leads the people through this process of, of offering the sacrifice. He, he tells them, listen, I want you to remember this. And I want you to celebrate this year after year after year to remind you of what I did. It's going to be a testimony to your kids. It's going to be a testimony to your grandkids. It's going to be a testimony to your great, great, great grandkids. And for generations to come, you observe this Passover. You keep this Passover so that you will continue to tell the story, the sacrifice of that innocent lamb. And then when Jesus comes along, that's what he's doing with the disciples in the upper room. They are observing the Passover together. In a moment, we're going to observe it together. And again, um, you're not required to participate. Um, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, you've been forgiven and, and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then and we would invite you to, to participate today. But first and foremost, I want to I start kind of backing up to this question. Has the blood of Jesus Christ been applied to your life? Now, that may sound weird. Now, how, Andy, he died 2,000 years ago. <laughs> how do I apply his blood to my life today? Help me out here. Scripture says we, we do this by faith. We trust in it. We believe in it. That what Jesus Christ did, he did for me. And I want to invite you to pray. I want to just invite everyone here right now just to bow your heads and, and close your eyes. And if you need to place your faith and trust in Jesus, what, do you, what would you wait on? Like, like, what would have to happen? What would God have to do for you to say yes to Jesus? Man, I pray that he does it. And I pray that right now you would, you would soften your heart and you would respond. You see, here's the thing about justice. It's, it's not just punishment. It's also reward. Like if God is a just God and he is, and he is righteous in, in every judgment, he not only punishes the evil, but he rewards the righteous. Scripture says that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. Listen, God has an eternal reward for you today that he wants to give to you freely if you would reach out and accept it. This reward is not like the reward that the Israelites had when they went and asked their neighbors for silver and gold. And when they left in, in freedom, they, man, they left <laughs> carrying the, the, the riches of this, of this gold and this silver. Listen, the riches that Christ has to offer us today, it's not temporary gold, it's not temporary wealth. It is everlasting life. That's the riches that we inherit. And as my wife and I talk about, man, I'd, I'd rather have a broom closet in heaven. <laughs> Man, what a glorious broom closet that would be. What a glorious inheritance that would be. Listen, if you've never trusted him, would you pray a, a prayer simply like this? God, today I recognize that in your justice, you must punish sin. God, and I, I'm a sinner. My heart has a bent towards evil, has a, a bent towards things of, that are not of you. And I, and I fall short of, of your perfect and holy standard. And God, today, right now, I wanna, I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life. I, wanna, I want the blood of Jesus to cover my sin. I want his sacrifice to be the one who died in my place. Because God, I don't wanna die and spend eternity away from you. I wanna receive that, that eternal reward of heaven right now in this moment. So God, I place my faith and trust in Jesus alone. And God, I don't, I don't have it all figured out. I don't exactly know where to go from here. But God, I'm making the first step and I'm making the first move. And I'm saying yes to Jesus and yes to the cross. In Christ's name, and all God's people said.